right, we're back at the Cracks in Postmodernity, and we're here today with Benjamin Harold, who is a longtime education journalist based in Philly, and he is recently the author of Disillusioned, the Story of Five Families and the Unraveling of America's Suburbs. Ben, thanks so much for coming on. So glad to be here. So for people who aren't familiar with you already, tell us a little bit about your background and then how you got the idea to write this latest book, Disillusioned. Um, I grew up in a uh, post-war suburb of Pittsburgh called Penn Hills. It's about 10 miles east of downtown. And, uh, you know, I'm white. My family's white. And we moved in in the 1970s when the community was still nearly all white, 90% uh, white. And so it really was a community and a place that worked really, really well for us without us really having to do too much other than get in there. So, you know, my parents ended up buying a home, got a cheap mortgage. They uh, got tax breaks that went along with that. They were, you know, able to enjoy mostly new infrastructure structure and, you know, above all in the public schools, which were really molded in the interest to meet the needs and desires of families like ours, they got a great deal for us as well. So, you know, I had a really positive experience um, in public schools. I really felt like they were a place that kind of nurtured my gifts and talents and, you know, uh, helped me with my weaknesses, all the things you would want a school to do. And so I left in 1994. I graduated and felt like I needed to get out and see the real world. You know, I wanted to be anywhere but suburbia. And so I eventually came to Philly and became a journalist and spent most of my career, you know, really interested in the space between America's promises and its realities and really thinking that I'd find answers to that in big cities and in depressed rural areas. And then about after about 10 years, um, in journalism, I started to see all these headlines come out of Penn Hills, that su suddenly the same town that was, or the same school district that had served my white family so well, it's now $172 million in debt. Uh, teachers are being laid off, uh, programs being cut, uh, services being slashed, property taxes going up, home values stagnating, and like really seeing that suburban dream erode in real time. And so uh, it very quickly became evident that that coincided with this dramatic demographic shift. So the public schools were 72% white when I graduated. By the time all this started hitting the, hitting the fan, they were 62, 63% black. And so what that really made me realize was like all of those opportunities that my family had received earlier were made possible in part by pushing the true costs off into the future for someone else to essentially pick up the tab. And so at first I wanted to know like, hey, is this like how, uh, you know, how did this come to be in my hometown? But then wanted to know like, is this happening elsewhere also? And that led me, you know, across the country to end up focusing on the five different suburban families and communities featured in the book. Yeah, so I mean, those people who are familiar already with cracks in postmodernity with our podcast, with our Substack, know that you know we're very into critiques of suburbia, uh, the phenomenon of white flight and ethnic assimilation, and especially as they tie into questions about religion and secularization. And the thing is, I mean, I, I shared some of my articles with you, Ben, and you know, you can see our critique tends a little bit more towards the psychological and the metaphysical, spiritual effects of suburbia. But your book, I mean, it's focusing mostly, I mean, it's kind of coming from the sociological political lens, which which uh, highlights a lot of important factors that I think get too easily ignored in these conversations, especially the implications having to do with race, the legacy of segregation and integration. Um, and you, you really show through these stories that, that, you, uh, that you're featuring the ways that racism, colorism continue to reemerge even after, you know, legally, you know, uh, integration was put on the books that systemic or that, you know, again, like de jure racism was erased. Um, so I don't know. So for, can you tell people who haven't read the book yet? I mean, we hope they do, but tell people like, what did you discover through following these five families and what, what mainly do you want to get across to readers? Yeah, I think first, I, I think that's a, it's a tremendous, uh, you know, observation and, and question there, because, you know, in many ways, I think the approach that I took to the book is that the, the kind of like root problems um, that we're seeing in suburbia or the root of the problems that we're seeing in suburbia now are are both. They're really these kind of systemic, structural, sociological things, but but they're also psychological and spiritual and kind of metaphysical. And those two things actually play back and forth with each other. And so like for me, that you know, is reflected in approach to writing the book, which kind of came from two angles at once. So on the one hand, it is a big sociological critique. And the, the idea that we use is pulled in part from a group called Strong Towns USA, which writes about suburbia as a, as a Ponzi scheme. And there's definitely an economic piece of that, you know, this idea that these communities are, are heavily subsidized, build up almost overnight um, without any real plan for long term maintenance and renewal. And then when the bills come due, the families of means tend to just leave and start over somewhere new rather than actually investing and fixing in that, leaving a host of problems for who comes behind. But what I think Strong Towns misses is the way that that's fundamentally racialized across American suburbia that, you know, by statute and by practice and enforced by all kinds of means, including terrorist violence. These communities were all white and almost entirely middle class for 
much of their early existence, first two or three generations in many cases. Um, and so that that lives on, that kind of continues. And so, um, you know, this idea of it being a racialized Ponzi scheme where white families like mine are able to reap the benefits of suburbia by, a lot, by forcing someone else, a black and brown family that follows us a generation later to pay for it, like that is the big structural idea. But at the same time, the book does follow these five families. And the idea is that, like, you know, my view and my belief and, and perspective is that we all are kind of inextricably bound up with these patterns and forces. Like, they're they're inescapable. There are contexts that we swim in. But what we can do is change our relationship to it. And what I think the five families are doing over the course of the book is really trying and struggling to figure out how to renegotiate their relationships with suburbia, in part because the dreams and the expectations that we bring to suburbia are so profound and so deeply held. This idea of what's the future we want for our kids, what's the good life, how can we be safe, all of that is baked in. So trying to renegotiate that on the fly is very, very fraught, both internally and politically when you have multiple different groups trying to do it at the same time. Yeah, but I'm, uh, you know, reading these family stories, it does, you know, we're coming with, with the prejudice of, again, like my kind of like psychological, spiritual lens towards these things. It makes me wonder, like, is there something inherent about the structure of suburbia, the landscape of it, that amplifies the racial tensions that exist more broadly in the country? Like, is, is there something about that environment that makes you see it in a, in a certain light? I'm wondering. I'll, I'll give you an example from a conversation I recently had. So, um, you know, I, I write a lot about in the book about Penn Hills, the town that I grew up in. Um, outside of Pittsburgh. And so there's another writer um, who um, also graduated from Penn Hills High and now still lives in Pittsburgh, but is a, you know, is, is a well-known writer, um, Damon Young, who wrote um, for Very Serious Brothers and then also wrote um, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Blacker. And so he and I were going to be on a panel together at the book festival there, and we did an interview for it beforehand and we're talking about it. And a, a version of that question was posed to him, like, well, what was this like for you as, uh, you know, a black teenager whose family moved into Penn Hills from the city when you when you were, you know, in, in I believe it was 10th or 11th grade. And he was talking about how viscerally he felt that the place had been engineered to keep families like his out. And the two examples he gave were public transportation and sidewalks. In his case, his family didn't have a car and it made it very, very difficult to get around both logistically because public transportation is so spotty and bad and socially because it was such a taboo to do that. Like it was such a marker of not belonging. And so I think those kinds of things are, you know, again, they're, they're, they're extremely prevalent and they're closely linked. Like the psychological social piece feeds into the, you know, kind of structural policy piece and vice versa. Yeah. And I, the other thing I'm that seeing these family stories made me look at is, um, you know, you see how much this this racial drama, which again, we we would have hoped was resolved by the Civil Rights Act and by other laws that takes certain things off the book. Like we see how it, it continues to exist. It continues to kind of infect our, our American society mm -hmm. today. Um, and it, I don't know, like I found that to be very frustrating to see that we're this far ahead. People who supposedly made it, who, you know, succeeded living the American dream, like continue to face this discrimination as you display um, in, in the public school systems. Um, I don't know, like it, it's hard to read it without feeling this kind of sense of despair or this, this frustration. So I don't know, like for you having really spent time with these families, seeing this all firsthand, um, what do you think is, uh, like, what do you think is missing from our discussions about race? Like, what do you think would really, it would really take for us to make substantial headway to, to correct these injustices that you, that you saw and documented? Yeah, I think I can talk about that in the context of suburbia and in schools in particular, um, because what it brings to mind really is you know th this idea that um, the challenges that we face around both race and suburbia are are rooted in the dreams that we bring to suburbia and the dreams upon which suburbia is built. And so most of post-war suburbia is really built, you know, my argument is that it's really built on one of three primary dreams. You had this kind of like vision of uh, building a white middle class to the exclusion of others and kind of creating uh, havens for consolidating racial and class advantages. Like that's been very prevalent since the post-war period, particularly for middle-class white families. Um, but then there's the post-civil rights era dreams as well. The one kind of about equal access, you know, desegregating public schools and fair housing were closely linked throughout the civil rights movement and the idea of opening up suburbia uh, and its opportunities and resources. That, that's a fundamental version of that suburban dream. And then likewise, there are suburbs around the country, including Evanston, Illinois, which I feature in the book, that really have this longstanding commitment to trying to make integration work, to trying to make, you know, a racially harmonious community work. And so, you know, those, those dreams are all in there. And I think part of what's so challenging right now, 
is that all three of those dreams are faltering. It's harder for white families seeking racial and class advantages to get up to buy into a community that affords that. Um, lots of families like the Robinson family who I profile in Atlanta, Georgia, in the suburbs in Gwinnett County there feel like, okay, we did everything right and kind of completed this multi-generational journey to suburbia and it's still not working out. So what do we do now? And a place like Evanston, where you see them actually retreating from this 50 year commitment to, to desegregation. And so in some ways that's really scary. It's a time of a lot of friction and turmoil and uncertainty. But I think there also are opportunities in that. And part of what I learned and walked away from the book different from when I started was realizing you know, two things. So one is that there are these other dreams that are being brought into suburbia now. So like I write about the Hernandez's in Compton, they're an undocumented family who's really bringing this dream of like material, Amer traditional American dream success, but for the families who have historically been most excluded from the suburbs. So like their son is in schools where they're like explicitly preparing him to work at Apple or Lucasfilms, and he's thinking about that in fourth grade. And then in Penn Hills, I ended up following and getting to know Bethany Smith, who's an African-American mom who bought the house three doors down for me uh, from my childhood home in 2018. And over the course of getting to know her and writing the book, and she actually ended up writing part of the book herself, like part of what became evident was that she was bringing in to Penn Hills a dream that was very different from the dream that it was built upon. It was a dream that was much more explicitly grounded in community and intergenerational responsibility and repairing what's broken and all that. And it was a dream that she had brought from her, the, the, the inner city black community that she grew up in in Pittsburgh. It was a historic black part of the Hill District called Sugar Top. And so the hope, I think, is the idea that like there are, are these other examples and models of how to do things differently emerging if we're willing and able to recognize them. And that also like there are these alternative versions of the American dream that I think offer a lot much more promise for the challenges uh, we face ahead than the ones that we're still, you know, kind of trying to trying to make work in suburbia. Mm. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about these different versions of the American dream, I don't know, like I look at my own experience and like, you know, my family, ethnic whites who were in the inner city, made their way into the suburbs, did pretty well for themselves. And I found that for me, like growing up in the suburbs, again, like going back to this kind of like cultural, spiritual dimension of it, like I found that it was kind of flat. Like I felt very much disconnected from my culture, from a sense of, from like a rich sense of, you know, a rich like spiritual sense of what the, of what the world is, because that's what suburbia is. It's predictable. It's kind of bland. And I found myself drawn to the old neighborhood that my family came from. And I eventually moved back into one of those, you know, the, the neighborhoods that my family was from. And I found that life was very different there. Um, and it leads me, I don't know, like, I think it's the fact that I'm coming from an ethnic white family definitely shapes my experience of that dynamic. But then I see like when I was living in the city, like I saw immigrant families who are on white, mostly who are Latino, who uh, some of them like really wanted to get out of the city, move to the suburbs and live this kind of quiet, sedated life. Um, I saw others who enjoyed life in the city because again, it afforded them more space to live out their, their beliefs, to, to you know celebrate their culture, to be connected to others in the community. And I couldn't help but like, like the ones who, who said like, we really wanna make it into the suburbs, wanna get out of the city. I couldn't help but say like, okay, but do you realize what you're gonna be losing? when you move there again from this this like emotional spiritual level like life can get very flat there there's something there's something about again the structure of suburbia that kind of suffocates this this vivacity the spontaneity that you can find in the city um so i don't know like i'm wondering do you think that like what do you say to the family who's like yeah we just want to get out of the city to live the quiet life um yeah. you know i think it's really understandable uh, and there's a reason that hundreds of millions of people have kind of made this decision over the course of the last, you know, roughly 100 years. Like, it's a very compelling um, sales pitch. And there are very real benefits attached to it, both kind of psychologically and day to day living wise and materially and financially and socially. Um, and so, you know, I think, again, it, it like makes sense. And there's a reason people want that and like that. I think the challenge that we face is that the actual real kind of suburban promise, that kind of contract of, uh, you know, promise where you're going to get all of these benefits with none of the costs and you're going to be able to control the composition of the community in the way that you want to, like, that's the thing that's not, you know, increasingly tenuous and, and, and hard to find and even harder to hold on to. And so that's part of why we're seeing, I think, that that friction. Um, and so, you know, and I think the other part of it is like the nature of the demographic changes. So suburbia absolutely, you know, functioned as kind of a homogenizing machine for ethnic whites from various different backgrounds, depending on which part of the country that you were in. And like everyone just kind of becomes quote unquote white. Um, 
but that looks and feels different, I think, with Latino families and uh, Black families in particular. Um, and uh, the the dynamics, uh, because of the, the racial elements of that becomes, and language issues often too, become very, um, it just becomes very different. And it, also because you have communities that were already built up to be one thing and feel one way for one specific target constituency. Now, you know, partly trying to adapt to serve a new constituency while partly trying to hold and retain on to the old constituency. And they end up divided against themselves because those things are often at odds um, and race being central to that. And so, you know, I think that uh, like the downside of that is that we're seeing a lot of kind of conflict and change and turmoil in communities that, you know, many families hoped would be stable and, you know, on into, you know, the indefinite future. Um, but I think the opportunity is that is that suburbia actually becomes a really vibrant, diverse, alive kind of place in a way that runs very counter to the like the myths we still hold from Leave it to Beaver and Wonder Years and all of that. Like a place like Gwinnett County outside of Atlanta is like one of the most diverse places on earth. Like there's an extraordinary cultural, linguistic, racial, ethnic diversity that is finally starting to be reflected in the political leadership of the municipality as well in ways that, again, I think are really interesting and, and compelling and, and offer the opportunity for something much richer. So you do think that there is there's potential to experience that kind of vibrant, diverse communal communal life in a suburb environment. It's not it's not really so this. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you like one example that comes to mind, like from Gwinnett County. Like I, you know, the school board politics in Gwinnett County were are a big part of the book, and I followed them quite a bit. And so one of the gentlemen that I followed is a guy named Everton Blair Jr. So um, he's a gay black son of Jamaican immigrants who grew up in Gwinnett County went away to Harvard and then Stanford, and then felt like, hey, how come this 180,000 student school system that I went to that is now, you know, more than three quarters non-white has never in its entire existence had a board member of color. And so he came back and he ran and he won. And so, but at first he's just kind of the lone young person of color, progressive voice on the board, and there's not much he can get done. So he starts kind of working with the, you know, democratic officials to try and start organizing to get more candidates to run. And so when I was down there as part of the reporting, I went to a fundraiser that was being held um, to try and support Democratic candidates for school board and state legislature. And the thing that was um, so like the two things that like really struck me as just like so um, emblematic of this kind of like very different version of suburbia that has already emerged, we just don't talk about it much, was that um, the fundraising event for these suburban politicians was held on Juneteenth as a celebration of Juneteenth, and it was in a black run barbecue restaurant in Gwinnett County in a strip mall that billed itself as the place you can go to to have fun on the weekends without going into the city. And so, you know, you start to see our notions of what's suburban and what's urban and, you know, kind of the, the cultural expectations, like all of that stuff starts to change with the population. We're just slow to embrace it and adapt to it because of our preconceived notions and biases. Yeah, and the other thing that going back to this, these different construals of the American dream, like I appreciated that you included some of the family's experience of faith and how that shaped their mm -hmm. ideals, you know, their their own personal dreams. Um, yeah. So can you say a little bit about the way that religion plays a role in, in life in the suburbs, at least for some of the families that you spend time with? Yeah, I think in a couple different ways and sometimes competing ways. So one of the families that I follow is the Beckers. They're an affluent um, a conservative white family from Texas who end up settling in an ex-urban community outside of Dallas. And they are um, conservative, not just politically, but kind of culturally and religiously as well. They're Methodist and, you know, kind of small town Texas upbringings. And that's very much reflected in their faith as well. And so it's a big part of their lives. And so part of what they're looking for when I meet them, they're getting ready to leave Plano, which is diversifying and changing really quickly. And where they've never really found the kind of community that they imagined and wanted, where it's like our kids go to church together and go to school together. And, you know, we can look out for each other and we have cookouts on the weekends and all that. And it just never happened because there was too much age and cultural and racial and economic diversity in the place, and they never found that there. So they really want to get into a community where they can find that, what for them feels like community and safety and the ability to live the life that they want to leave or live the life that they want to live. Um, but, uh, you know, and faith is a big part of that, but it becomes really, really expensive for them to do that. And then part of what ends up happening is that their faith puts them at odds with the public school system that... Um, they've really reorganized their life around. So they want to be in a community that has schools that reflects their values and beliefs. And part of those values and beliefs are, you know, during the COVID era, like very strong beliefs around health freedom and the idea that we should not be forced to wear masks, for example. Um, and so that, um, you know, kind of becoming such a touch point that they end up 
pulling their children out of the public school that they've rooted their whole uprooted their whole lives in order to get into and instead instead enroll them in um, online private religious school run by the John Birch Society. And so I think you see these kind of intersections of like different notions of family community faith and, and race kind of come together in different ways and depending on what part of the country you are and what demographics you're dealing with. In Pittsburgh, like on the other hand, like, you know, Bethany Smith, the African-American mom who now lives on my old street, you know, she grew up uh, very involved in the Presbyterian church and, and remains so. And, you know, her faith is in many ways very central to that that dream that I talked about her bringing to the suburbs, this idea of the intergenerational responsibility and, um, you know, thinking about you know, long term in the future and taking care of each other, like all of that is really rooted in her faith life that was part of that community. And she has struggled to find that in suburbia and in fact goes back to her old church most times to to attend service. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's 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 part of the the you know, I guess, kind of cultural milieu of the place, um, but it also gets tied into all of these other, um, you know, kind of conflicts and tensions that we're seeing because how we feel about our religion and faith and some of the views that emerge from that are often so tied to our racial and economic position in society. Yeah, and I mean, you you also show how much the culture wars, especially during, you know, the onset of COVID, but also the summer of George Floyd, like how much that really played a huge role in exacerbating race relations, relations in general in suburbia. Um, and I don't know, like you see there's this back and forth between the quote unquote people in, in favor of this kind of woke view and then the reactionaries who feel threatened by it. And I don't know, like I'm wondering, seeing all this back and forth, this discord, um, I don't know, like what do you think it, it takes to really transcend this dichotomy and like make real headway? Like what what can we do as we're looking forward to to really take into account different people's concerns and actually move forward together if it's possible at all? Yeah, I mean, I think we have historically been really bad at that. Um, it's, um, you know, something that America in general and suburbia in particular really struggle with. Although I do think sometimes we lose sight too of the, the, the progresses and successes we've had with that. But, you know, I think by and large, it's still mostly a struggle. And so I think part of the, you know, the way to, I don't want to say a solution or an answer, but like the way that I think about approaching that now, I, there are like kind of two, two big streams of it. So one is I think, um, having a wider lens and being more patient of uh, the idea of like, this isn't an isolated moment in time that is like a, you know, a, a change or a shift that's going to happen over five years or 10 years or even 50 years. Like we're living through a, a significant historical shift uh, in both the country's history and in, you know, this idea of, um, you know, America as an entity and with a place in the world. Like I think it's been it's be, that's becoming something new as well. So like all that stuff's going to take a really long time. And so once we, uh, you know, kind of can step back and say, okay, this is going to be messy inevitably. So how do we make that mess as productive as possible? I think can lead to different conversations than trying to find like the perfect solution right now for what is in front of us right now. There are downsides to taking a long view too. You want to try and make things as good as possible as quickly as possible. But I think, you know, having a long view helps. And I think part of why it helps is because I do think that the relational person to person kind of human part of this is, you know, equally important with the policy and the structural part of it. I think they have to go hand in hand. And so like in Penn Hills, but like how that shows up in the book is like, you know, I really wanted to come away with this with like a policy solution or a dollar number that I could say, you know, if you just do these three things and put in this much money, we could feel confident that this system will be repaired and work well again. Mm -hmm. And I just never got there, I think, in part because the foundation of the place is so fundamentally flawed that like just pouring more money on top of that, uh, like what's the clear fix there? And so where that led me was again, like starting to listen more closely to, to Bethany and to, to the dreams that she had brought into Pittsburgh. And again, this idea of having this kind of like faith lens on it and thinking about it and feeling it and, and experiencing it through this idea of a, a multi-generational arc, like that allowed her and I to work through a lot of the difficulties and tension points that we had, you know, with me as a white guy coming in, trying to write her story as an African-American mom in this community that we had very different experiences of. And so it was like her grace and willingness and capacity to say, okay, I will like, I'm going to be patient with you until you can see it in this new way so that we can talk about it the way I want to talk about it, that I think was was extraordinarily valuable to me. And I'd like to think that my, you know, capacity to listen and create opportunities for, for Bethany, for example, to share her own story did something for her as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I th think having her in, in the epilogue, like, that was really striking to me because you see these, again, these back and forth people reacting to each other, especially at these school board meetings. And you see that uh, there's this kind of tribalism, you know, and I, I do think, like, you have these people who have very valid concerns. I mean, most most of their concerns are valid, but then they get warped by these kind of ideological framings. And then you see the other person who has another set of concerns is the enemy, and you know, I have to fight against them, I have to eliminate them. And it's much harder to see that, like, okay, but I, I live with these people, I live in the same city. Sure, we have different, we have certain differences, but like, I kind of do feel like, again, the landscape of suburbia, because it's so isolating, makes us less inclined towards this spirit of collaboration and trying to understand. I'd rather retreat into my tribe and have to fight for my set of my own ideology. But the fact that, you know, your experience with Bethany, like, yeah, there were disagreements. You didn't see eye to eye. Um, she was just kind of frustrated at a certain point with the way yeah. that you were, you were telling the story. Um, and the fact that, you know, you continue the conversation, you don't just walk away and become enemies, but also that you invite her to contribute to the book, to contribute her own words. I mean, I think that offers a really meaningful model of like how to, to work out our differences and try to understand each other. Um, so I don't know. I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about how you work things out with her and then how you came to the decision to invite her to, to contribute her that section of the book? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think the place to start is like Bethany is just an awesome person. So like the, you know, I, we met because I knocked on her door. I'd gone back to the, the street where I grew up and I had a list of all the properties that had recently sold. And I just started knocking on doors, hoping to meet families that were living there now and see what their experiences were like. And so, you know, three doors down from where I grew up, I knocked and she opened and just like right away, you could, you know, she's a very warm person and very like just kind of perceptive and curious and, you know, has a lot to say. So it was, it was very enjoyable right off the bat. And so, you know, and she talked very freely, like shared a lot of her experience and perspectives and beliefs um, in ways that were, you know, really great. But there's always kind of, particularly in a long involved project like this, like more and more and more of that. So we got about a year into that and she started to get very uncomfortable. And so at one point during conversation, she told me like, um, you know, Ben, I feel like, um, like the way it had actually come up in the course of a conversation where I was trying to basically check something from a previous conversation. And I said, you know, Bethany, I just want to make sure I'm telling your story the right way here. Can we go back over this such and such thing? And she was quiet. And then when she finally spoke, she said, it was the way you said, tell my story that just hit differently right there. And the way she put it was like, I could see all of American history kind of flashing through my eyes of like white people coming and, you know, telling people of color stories and profiting from them and us getting nothing in return. And I don't want that to happen here. And I feel like I've given you, um, I'm giving out so much. What am I getting back? I'm worried about that. And so in the moment, like the first thing that was clear was that she was correct. And the second was that I was really uncomfortable. Like it was turning the spotlight back on me in a way that I wasn't used to and that was uncomfortable. And so we kind of left that initial conversation of both kind of having to kind of think and pray on it. And we'll kind of come back together. And it really wasn't until about six or eight weeks later that we actually connected. And I think, again, like that patience and having that long view in there, like part of why that was helpful for me was I could kind of go back to the root of it and say part of the reason I all like from the very beginning that I enjoyed talking with Bethany so much and was so eager for her to be part of the book was because she surprised me all the time. Um, even to like the reason she was in Penn Hills, like what she felt about it, what she, she liked and didn't like about her son's schools, like all like every step of the way, she would surprise me in a way that was like really delightful. And so I just felt confident that like, okay, if we create an opportunity for her to do her, like in a way that feels right to her, that she'll create something surprising and wonderful um, that can be part of this. And so, you know, when we talked, I presented that invitation to her. I said, you know, would you like to write part of this for compensation? Um, and she was, again, quiet for quite a while and then said, you know what, yes, I've actually always wanted to write and had some experience writing. And so it became, you know, again, this thing that um, um, made the relationship much more and the benefits much more reciprocal. Um, and so, you know, she not only wrote the epilogue and was compensated for that, but like owns a small stake in the project overall. And um has been very actively involved in the public discourse around it, you know, doing media interviews, writing her own pieces, going to events and talks, all in a way that I think, you know, makes the, the project as a whole immeasurably richer. Yeah, and I think there's something to be said first about, like, your willingness, both of your willingness to stay in the tension with each other and not to just walk away because it got uncomfortable, but also your willingness to, like, be surprised by her, to, to recognize that, I don't know, like, there's more to a person than the immediate reaction they have. And vice versa with her. Um, so I don't know, like it's it was very as much as yeah, like a lot of a lot of what these stories conveyed like made me frustrated, made me hopeless at some points. Like the fact that you end on this note 
Um, I don't know, like opens the door to to a lot of folk. Um, so, yeah. so just to, to wrap things up, I'm wondering, can you tell us like, what would you say is like the most important thing that you learned from spending time with these five families? Like what, what, what do you really want to convey to, to the people reading your book? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And I would say, you know, there's the big idea that we discussed about this kind of racialized Ponzi scheme. And I do think that that, like sitting with that and kind of thinking it through and looking at a, a, a metropolitan region over a course of several generations, it just like allows us to see and understand the communities and landscapes that we drive through and live in every day in a different way. Um, and to say like, oh, wait, there's a reason when I go from this boundary to that boundary that, you know, there's more vacant stores or the roads aren't fixed as well. Um, and there's a reason everyone's starting to leave my, all the white people in particular are starting to leave my my suburb now. Like it, it's not unpredictable. It's not an accident. And so being able to make sense of it, I think my hope is that that gives us a, a framework and a language to to understand our world in a way that we, you know, we, we're we're not particularly good at right now. So that would be one. I think two, you know, kind of this idea that um, there that part of what's happening in America right now and part of why the suburbs are so important to it is it is this kind of like picking apart and trying to reimagine these dreams around which our communities have been organized. And that's part of why it's so high stakes and part of why it's so tense and fraught. But this idea of like, you know, all the like the things we would organize our education, our careers, our families and our hopes for retirement around are no longer trustworthy. Like we can't count on getting out of that what we expected and feel like we were entitled to. Like that's a really big Big thing and it's only going to accelerate as demographic changes get faster and more dramatic and as we really run up against the environmental and kind of housing market limits of like just building further and further out to the countryside so there's a lot of pressures forcing us to recognize with this and we're only just beginning that so like understanding this pattern isn't just essential to understand what we see today but it's important to understand what we're going to be going through tomorrow and then the last piece I'd say is that there are models of hope out there and like we have to be willing to look at and try and find value and relevance in these other versions of the American dream, um, particularly this one that's rooted in kind of the African American struggle in in the United States. And then also, I think, like looking at the experiences of immigrants today and undocumented immigrants in day in particular, like there's so much about how they and society interact with each other that teaches us how to do things differently if we're willing to listen. And I think Compton becomes this powerful example of like, if we're willing to let go of preconceived notions and look in surprising places with new eyes, we can see that like, oh, wait, there's a model here for doing what suburbia was all about, like making this massive investment in kids so they can imagine new ways of having better future. Like we can still do that. And we can do that in a way that is, um, wholly inclusive of the families who are most vulnerable or most marginalized or have historically been most excluded from access to those opportunities. Um, and we can do it in a way that lasts, mm -hmm. but we have to think differently in order to get there. And so, um, you know, I hope that, uh, you know, people will, will, will look at the Compton piece in particular and say, hey, we, we, you know, this is a model we can look at for how to navigate this going forward. Yeah, no, I think this is this is crucial because again, it's it's easy to lose hope and become kind of pessimistic. But as you're saying, there are models out there, and all it really takes is looking closely at them, trying to learn from them and emulate them. I think, yeah, like this is a very essential place to start. And and again, I, I am very thankful to you that you did the work of not just theorizing about these things, but like actually spending time with real families and telling their stories because it gives you an insight that again, like pure theory, it's not going to give you you know yeah so so i really hope that people pick up disillusioned and then anything else that you want to plug before we go um just say you can find more about me and the work and how to buy the book at benjaminherald.com and it's h-e-r-o-l-d and thank you to you Stephen. this was a great conversation really appreciate the invitation and appreciate the the really thoughtful dialogue awesome thank you for coming on thank you.